So uh, welcome everyone. So this is Yoga again, and we are connecting on the third session of the third day of the second edition of Global Soccer Conference. Just a touch upon what has happened so far in the day. Uh, first, it was data-driven decision making in Hall One, which was predominantly discussed about uh, use of data in player and team performance, analytics, fan engagement, also revenue generation. And then parallel in Hall Two, it was all about sport journalism and how today's sports presentation all about. And the way they tackled it pretty much how during the pandemic the adjustments they had to make without the fans and all those kind of things so today we are here uh, at the red and blue ocean of football business so the focus area for today is going to be how traditional football revenue streams have saturated um, what is the women's football's growth and potential and how can we explore new revenue streams and of course technology and innovation in creating new commercial opportunities so we have a great panel. Um, instead of me uh, introducing the panel, it would be nice if you can all one by one introduce yourselves. So starting with Daniel Parnell. Hello, Yoga. Thank you. Um, so I'm Dan Parnell. I'm an associate professor in sport business at, at the University of Liverpool. Um, and I look after a number of different roles within the football industry too. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, next is Fabian. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my name is Fabian Ulrich. Um, I'm head of international relations and strategic projects at the German Football Association, the, the DFB. Yeah. Um, in parallel to that, um, I'm a lecturer uh, at Akadis University um, here in the Frankfurt area in sports management. Uh, great. And next up is Luis. Hi there, everyone. My name is Luis Villar. I work as a, a pro rector in Universidade Europeia in Portugal. Uh, my background is on sports sciences, so I have my master and my PhD on sports science. Uh, however, I started some, some decade ago studying sports management, and I'm in between fields. And I also work as a, a commentator on on Portuguese sports TV. Multiple personality, really. Thank you so much for joining, Luis. And over to you, Stephen. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Morrow, and uh, I'm a senior lecturer in sport finance at the University of Stirling uh, in Scotland. Uh, and uh, I look after our MSc programme in sport management, and uh, my research is kind of focused on business aspects of sport for probably more, more years than I care to remember. I guess you're in Scottish because you be Indians always struggle with the Scottish accent, but you're, you seem to be perfectly fine. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, starting with, I just want to pitch this to all pretty much. I just wanted to understand from the perspective of everyone of here to let us know like how saturated are the traditional commercial streams when we call it like broadcasting, mass day and sponsorship revenues. How, how saturated is this income has become? Uh, starting with anyone, Daniel. Would you like me to start you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, Stephen's probably better better place than me to comment okay. on on some of that kind of stuff. But I think what we found is is that there's probably some of the challenges. I would say they're not completely saturated. I think we've got challenges with engagement of and maintenance of existing markets that we're working with. And like like anything, we've had a, a time away as a result of the pandemic, and it's about trying to rebuild those relationships and. I think if you see any, any, if you look at businesses now, they responded to the, the financial crashes in, in, in history. It's businesses that were able to maintain and also build upon their relationships and, and fan bases, their customers during those periods. So I, I think we've, we're yet to see what's going to happen, but clubs that have worked with the community programs, stayed entrenched within the communities, kept that low, low regional locality and looked after those supporters, I think will come out of and will have come out of the pandemic in a, in a stronger position. Those that haven't invested in them, they're going to have like, an uphill battle to rebuild um, the relationship with the, the local fans and supporters. That's my current take. Amazing. Like, I, I think the most challenging one is going to be the, um, the challenges of restarting with the relationship with the stakeholders and, of course, fans. Uh, it's nice, so nice to see the Premier League back again with all the fans and and we just hope this can continue for a long time. Uh, yes, Stephen, your thoughts on this? Yeah, no, I think I agree with what Dan, Dan said there. Uh, I think 
I think so much has changed over such a short period of time that uh, if you'd asked that question 18 months ago, we might have given you one answer and then all of a sudden we're having to reinterpret the way in which uh, an industry operates and things that it's taken for granted. And I think perhaps maybe something that's worth adding is it probably demonstrates the risk in some industries of over-dependence on some sources of income. Um, you know, we saw that with the way in which we had some uh, revenue sources like media sources really quite threatened by the pandemic uh, and the risks that would pose for clubs. So I think maybe in some ways it's, a, it's clearly not a good thing, but there's some learning to come from it in the sense of trying to look for diversified income streams so you've got a more stable base uh, to cope with other challenges that will, that will doubtless come down the line. So I think there's a degree of maturity around the industry, but I think there's a lot of innovative opportunities available and perhaps an opportunity to think about uh, diversifying income streams so there's a bit less dependence on any one source. Great, amazing. It's, it's so nice that it can stay like that for a long time. So I just move on to Fabian. Uh, I'd like to check with you. Like uh, You're working at DFP and the Interestations. Now, what are the new commercial projects that football traditions like DFP are venturing into uh, for opening up new revenue streams? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so first of all, um, I, I can only agree to, to what Daniel and Stephen uh, just, just said. Um, along the same lines, um, I think um, sports and, and, and the relation between uh, sports associations, sport leagues and sports clubs um, will, be, will be more dependent um, well, with, with the fans, will be more dependent on, on, on technology, on, on the sports technology market. Um, in the preparation of, of our talk today, um, I, I, I did some, some additional research, the one I, I do at university, and, and, and I came across a figure um, that, uh, that, that the global sports technology market is, is estimated to be um, roughly um, $12 billion worth, and um, that is a remarkable number. Nonetheless, uh, the CAGR expectations um, for the years to come are even more remarkable. Uh, they amount for, for a growth um, of, of 17 to, to 20 percent. So that that alone uh, speaks um, in in favor that that clubs, that associations, that um, uh, yeah, sports organizations per se um, need to open up. And 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 this is what 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 uh, what we what we are doing. What what I kicked off um, at, at the DFB. Um, we incorporated um, yeah the, the perspective of. Um, of startup companies, of, of incorporating fresh ideas to the uh, to the current business model of the of the DFB, um, it, predominantly when it comes to fan engagement, so to to the relation building relationship or in, increasing deepening the relationship between um, the team, um, the, the, the national teams, um, and, and 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 the followers and, and fans. Um, but that needs that needs to be managed and and, and pushed forward actively um, by the by, by the sports organization. And um, here there, there are very very good examples already already present in the market. Um, but but uh, I, I do see examples um, where where um, here and there sports organization definitely need to need to improve in order to uh, to to stay in the race. Great, uh, uh, this is amazing. Uh... One, one side, we are trying to build the commercials in the new streams always, and, and football as an industry has always been trying to explore new ways. And of course, like new technologies like esports and NFTs are coming up. Hopefully, you can see a lot of realizations in the coming future. Uh, now, the question is again to Stephen. Um, Stephen Morrow, uh, what are the major investment strategies over the years by football organizations, especially the clubs, and how are these changing in recent times? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. I think uh, lots of ways in which you, you can answer that. I think one of the first things to see, I think there's a lot of variety in what investment has gone into football over the years, and a lot of it's country specific as well. You see different different approaches, different kinds of models in, in different countries. If you look, if I look initially, so let's say the UK perspective, what we would traditionally would have had were local wealthy benefactors. They would have um, had some connection with a club or a local area. They would have put money into their club and they would have tried to run the club in a way that um, maybe, uh, you know, was not profit seeking. They were seen as some kind of sense of a benefactor, often, not always, of course. And they're interested in success and uh, business development, publicity, those kinds of things. Um, 
But in recent times, particularly in England, we've seen you know, big changes. We've seen much more uh, evidence of overseas investors coming in um, and with no connections, obvious or no evident connections with uh, some of the clubs they've invested in. And that, you know, that's they've perhaps got different kinds of objectives. Um, sometimes those are conventional financial objectives. Uh, other times, perhaps it's more to do with things like maybe what we might call sports washing, where you've got some sense of trying to um, create a different image for a country or an organisation. Um, and in some cases, frankly, if you're being honest about it, that's perhaps even worse. It's perhaps to do with things like money laundering or tax evasion or something of that nature. So we've got a lot of different reasons why people have come in and different approaches to those investments. I think it's also important to say, however, that um, uh, I think touching something Dan said earlier on, and, and Fabian will certainly know about too, we also see a lot of evidence um, in, Ge in Germany historically, but more commonly now in the UK, of supporter investment going into clubs, where you begin to see this idea of the, the image of football clubs as community organisations being represented in practice, not just in, in kind of words. And uh, you know, if I give you just one example from, from the UK, uh, the Scottish football club, Heart of Midlothian, has just become the largest supporter-owned football club in the UK. Um, and what's fascinating about that is that um, it's been a period of kind of transition from a club that was poorly run by an overseas owner, and that's been generous. Uh, it was a, a bridging benefactor came in, but a collective supporter vehicle have invested in the club and they've now bought over the club, but they've also been providing working capital to the club throughout the last five years. So a recognition that it's not just enough to invest in the purchase of the club, it's all about that ongoing investment. And yeah, in certain markets, and certainly in a smaller footballing market uh, like Scotland, that's a very, to me, is a very strong model because you're building in that kind of community and social significance upon which you can then try to excel as a sport organisation. So that's interesting. And of course, there's, there's a lot of parallels there with, uh, with the kind of German model, which tries in some ways to kind of harness both support and community ownership with bringing in external capital too. At the same time, you know, we know there are other things out there too. We know the other side of football, we can talk about community and the importance of social organisations, but we've got the private equity funding organisations who are also looking at football in other markets, back to England again, but other countries too, as a financial opportunity. Now, nothing per se wrong with that, as long as we've got some understanding of what the nature of those organisations is, that if it's simply being viewed as a, as a financial investment tool, then many of us would probably have concerns about that. But if it's a way of actually leveraging new capital, new funding, uh, and looking at innovation in the financing of organisations, I think there are, there are some benefits in that too. So there's, there's a lot going on. And, uh, you know, it, it's in some ways, it's quite exciting because you're seeing it from both directions. You're seeing financial innovation, but you're also seeing a community strengthening being reflected in financing too. And, uh, you know, I think that's something that keeps, keeps us very interested in looking at football in all the different countries that we're representing on the panel, but also that, that you're, uh, you're those attending the conference has got an interest in too, because there's so many different things in each individual country. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Just a follow-up question on this aspect, just because you touched upon the, the investments part, uh, you talked about obviously about the Scottish market, uh, the market adjacent to you, of course, the English one. Uh, it has over the years attracted a lot of investment uh, from US. And yes, there is a Middle East investment, but apart from the local region investments, there is also a lot of investments around like the US, the Glazers or the FSGs. Uh, even the, the Spurs owners. And why do you think English football is so appealing for uh, American owners? And what is your take on um, uh, them, for instance, with the ESL all coming up, why were they so much pro for it? Uh, are there any thoughts behind you, uh, behind this uh, from your perspective? Yeah, I, I think uh, you know the the ESL, as, as everyone knows, is a kind of fascinating case study because of uh, why is the SL attractive? It's attractive because it's it's a globally recognised uh, uh, product, and the revenue streams have you know have developed exponentially over over the life of the the uh, the EPL, and therefore you've got these very secure income streams. You've got extraordinary merchant, uh, extraordinary television deals. And therefore, if you're looking at it from a business perspective, you see stability of income, you see certainty of income, and you see very, very high levels of income and the opportunity to be involved in a product which is kind of globally recognised, if you put it in those terms. And that makes it that makes it attractive to people who are viewing football perhaps in more conventional financial terms than in some of the things we've been talking about so far. 
if you look at the lower leagues in England, if you look at the championship, of course, what you're looking at there is people trying to get into the promised land of the Premier League. So there's a lot of investment will go in there because some huge sporting organisations playing at the, the, the league below the Premier League who see their rightful place um, as being in the Premier League and also can see that the riches, frankly, that are offered from getting there. So that, that encourages some kind of investment in the hope that you get there. So... Of course, the risk of that is that they can only a small number of clubs will ever get promoted. And therefore, that, that creates other kind of financial challenges when there's almost overinvestment into what's still a competitive sporting league. Um, but England is, 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 is not quite unique, but it's certainly exceptional in terms of the, the way in which that league has developed over the last 20 years or so. Uh, and the sums of the, the revenues that are available to potential investors are huge, even although we still don't have a great record of profitability across the league as a whole. But nonetheless, there, there is a chance of making profit. Well, amazing insights. I just got, got to uh, just think about like one Indian investment into the championship and Blackman Towers. They, they just drop the scenes. So it's not necessarily that all overseas investments go into the right uh, model of functioning. It all depends on the way the club is structured and the way uh, the football is operated. So amazing insights. Thanks, Stephen. I'll, I'll come back to you from a different perspective. Uh, now over to Daniel again. Uh, Daniel, now we are talking about uh, a football structure which is quite very well organized and they built the profitability from top of it. But what do you see from a, an Asian African perspective? A lot of football structures are quite unorganized. So my question to you is, what can the football structures in Asia and Africa do in terms of uh, strategy and operational policies to bridge the gap uh, with the competitors in Europe? Okay, thank you, Yoga. I think the first off I'll premise this with is that I certainly don't want us to be seeing this as like, we're doing it well in Europe, this is what we should be doing because we have significant numbers of challenges that you'll all to, you know, be aware of it from the way we are owned, the way we are governed, and certainly our financial sustainability. I think one of the things I feel comfortable talking about and would tie into what Stephen says. Stephen's talked about financial sustainability, different types of owners, and just like the English Premier League and the Scottish Premiership, we also have quite a few uh, US owners, which is quite exciting in terms of those types of groups collaborating and working together and trying to influence the game and make it a better offering. Um, for me, this idea of new owners coming in, um, and we've seen this change over time, we've also seen them wanting to protect their investment. And one of the roles I've, I'm heavily involved in is, is this idea of a, a sporting director. So I, I'm chief exec of the Association of Sporting Directors that looks after sporting directors, technical directors globally. Now, this role, this role emerged because we've seen a lot of head coaches being sacked frequently, head coaches, managers, and there was often a lot of mistrust between the boards who often didn't have a football background and those working in that football environment. So the sporting director role was seen as an innovation, a way to get a competitive edge, to have someone on the board who could talk about football. And generally, the role was to by the owners to be the custodian of, of, of football sporting performance and to look after through effective leadership and, and good decision making the, the short, medium and long term of the club. And they would look after head coach recruitment, player trading, but also set like an identity of how an organisation or club would, would operate. However, this is about innovation and the sporting director role is like any innovation in any industry. In that when we brought it in, we've had lots of trial and error. So if you bring something new into existing structures and a status quo, it shakes things. And that means if, if we all sat on a board together and we brought in someone new to sit with us, we'd have to give up some of our decision-making powers. We'd have to share some of our resources. And um, that status quo would be challenged. And when we break down and take away, people don't like the status quo changing too much. So in football, we've seen us trial and error to varying degrees of success, this sport and director model and different titles, different ways, some on the board, some below the board, some next to the manager, with the manager, lots of different roles. And we are learning, we are sharing, we are trying to make sense of the very unique organisations that we are working with. So every club is unique and football is from our multi-club ownerships to our traditional owners uh, to American owners. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting period. We've got some successes, I would say. Um, we could argue in very different ways. So I say this tentatively with the, uh, the multi-club ownership model with um, Man City. Um, we've got the Red Bull group and we've got different people operating and they look close to home as an Everton supporter. 
If I look just across the park, we've got Michael Edwards, who's a sporting director at Liverpool Football Club, who's done tremendously well in recruiting an incredible head coach, but also delivering successful player trading and a strategy around it. So for me, if we were going to, and this is not just for to look away from Europe, in Europe we need to do better, in England we need to do better, but there's an opportunity there for owners to gain a competitive edge through bringing in people that can look after that, that sport and performance, not so for owners, but also for national associations. So I'm excited about the opportunities there. Yeah, it's really exciting and also intriguing because like you have a lot of emotions in the sport and the challenge is how well you balance your emotions and still keep up with uh, the way you maintain the structure and the way you run uh, the football show. And secondly, uh, Daniel, it's nice to know you are a Toffee fan, uh, but I'm a, I'm a Liverpool fan. But again, let, let, let's meet next time at the Merseyside and have a cup of coffee. Uh, so sure. Uh, uh, I'm coming to you, Louis, on this uh, a bit. I know I'm making you wait for a bit more time, but just because we were discussing the Asian uh, perspective on how to get the best practices from the best run things in Europe, I, I'm just going to Fabian again. And Fabian, uh, you're working in a federation in, in Germany, uh, in, the, in the federation in Germany. So how can football federations in Asia and Africa ensure that in terms of sustainability, sustainable business models, for overall growth of the football ecosystem in these regions? Um, thank you also for, for that question. Um, I would like to, to re-emphasize what, what Daniel said in the beginning. So it, it is definitely not on me or, or on us to, to decide or to, to suggest what, what to do. Um, we um, in, in, in Europe or in, in, in Germany um, do have um, uh, own uh, problems and, and challenges to tackle. Um, so, so it's definitely not, not on, on, on me to, to judge what to do, what not to do, or to, 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 to suggest in, in anyhow. What I, what I came across um, being responsible for the international relations um, of the DFB, I, I came across um, the tendency um, of, of some associations um, or some, let's say, football ecosystems um, to, uh, to, to try to copy and paste or to, to apply what, what has worked in, in other places. Um, to be quite frank, I'm, I'm rather critical about that approach because um, each and every single region, each and every single country, in each and every single um, football ecosystem does have his, his, its own prerequisites and, and, and circumstances that need to be taken into account. Um, and based on those, um, one one need to to um, to define um, yeah a, a suitable and and, and a viable uh, strategy and viable uh, approaches here. Um, that might be a, a disappointing answer, but that that is sort of the the overall um, um, umbrella, the overall um, yeah uh, bracket in, on 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 that one. Um, being more specific, um, Yogarash, um, I think um, we in, in in football probably fueled by the by the corona pandemic are somehow at a, at a, at a crossroads so um i think um the the, the historical business models that that people um and, and, and spectators come to the stadium watch the game buy some merch um and and, and go home um is is a bit outdated um so we we are, we are facing uh, the next generation gen z uh, that need to be motivated to not only to to watch and, and follow football but also to play football because there's there's an, a, a tremendous correlation um between act, playing actively in in a club or for a team be it organized or be just for fun um and following the the the, the um yeah the the the, the national leagues um, in, in 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 more depth and, and also spending spending money and, and to to yeah, contribute to that that um, business ecosystem. So focusing on, on them and offering here some some additional some some fancy um, features to to enrich the quote unquote product of, of football is is in my opinion very essential. Um, one means of, of 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 doing that is is providing providing data um, that. Um, sort of unlocks um, the, uh, the the rather tactical game of, of football and make it make it more comprehensive and, and make it more approachable for um, for for fans for, for for supporters and followers um, understanding what's going on. So so bringing it more towards the, the perspective of a coach or a scout, if you want. Um, 
and there have been very, very great examples, um, uh, both in, 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 in Europe, around the world, and, and uh, in, in, in Germany with, with the Bundesliga, uh, bringing on board um, uh, AWS, for, for instance, as a, as, a, um, as, a, as, a, as a data provider. Those are just examples um, where I think we, as, as a football community um, or soccer community, need to, need to dive into more. Um, and uh, um, and elaborate on 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 the on the future generation to come and adapt sort of um, our approach how we can have consumed football so far um, and and will do in the future. Yeah, thank you, thanks, Fabian. I I think it is so humble the panel and you've been so humble the way you put things. Um, I I think the most striking feature and striking point which you put is basically uh, how do we actually improve the overall participation of uh, the, the, the current youth or the current young generation into football. I think it's a major challenge, especially with the, the advent of esports, where like, there's a lot of gaming and people not uh, going out to play sport. Uh, and uh, there's more uh, distractions in the form of like the OTTs, uh, distractions from our perspective, from the game perspective. So I think, yes, uh, I think the biggest takeaway is like for all federations and uh, the ecosystems to constantly develop systems to engage the new generation to play more football. Uh, yeah, thank you, Fabian, on this. Uh, I'm just going to take a little, a little bit of a, a deviation. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, finally to Luis. Luis, uh, off late, you see uh, there's a lot of business around the player development. So you being Portuguese, I think you can be the best one to answer this. Uh, just we have seen like a enormous uh, uh, export of talent from Portugal with like likes of Joao Felix, Bruno Fernandes, like even Ederson who, who happened to play from Benfica and he, he went for a big money move for a keeper. So what is the Portuguese league to how it became one of the most profitable uh, ones in the transfer market uh, in the last decade? So thank you very much for, for, for your invitation. Um, I'm enjoying a lot listening to my teammates on the panel and uh, learning also uh, but regarding to your answer you you have to understand that portugal um, is competing in europe however it's not one of the big fives the big fives generate revenue streams uh, very higher uh, much higher than than portugal and to compete uh, portugal as other countries in the world must find um, second revenue streams that they can 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 potentiate uh, more more highly, um, and Portugal did it. So Portugal start to to understand that uh, players transfer are a revenue stream and are a stable revenue stream. So when you go to 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 ECA or to or to or to UEFA Financial Fair Play, they don't consider players transfer as a, a recurrent revenue stream. Uh, they consider it as an extraordinary revenue stream. So what Portuguese clubs did is starting to understand that rev that players transfers are stable revenue streams and there's a method and there's a way to to keep on generating profits. Uh, um, so first of all um, the, the commercial match day and TV rights are the traditional revenue streams are, are lower in Portugal. We are a country of 10 million so, but we have a strong football culture, okay, since Osebio in the, in the 60s um, and Figo in the, in the 90s and 2000s and, and the Cristiano Ronaldo now, um, it's not common to have a, a 10 million country um, with so many um, best players in the world. So when, when, you, when you see there's a lot of, uh, there's a big culture and then uh, the, the culture just translated to, to coaches. So what you see nowadays, it's kids with 18 years old that they want to be coaches. They don't want to be players. They want to be football coaches. So this started, this um, culture of football coaches started to, to be built on the 80s because we had our Portuguese um, national coach uh, that had a huge background. He was a professor in the university. So what he started, what started to happen in Portugal, there's a huge connection between universities and um, and football association clubs, uh, and this is since the 80s. 
which is a, a big uh, different from the most normal countries then the, the universities and the science background uh, started to, to enter in football uh, 20 years ago uh, probably in England that's most of it the, the reality in Portugal it started on the 80s and um, then then uh, we have a, a lot of uh, good coaches uh, José Mourinho of course it's one of them but uh, Nuno Espírito Santo, Paulo Fonseca, Luís Castro, Marco Silva a lot of coaches that that uh, that are doing well um, and there's a huge cultural social and um, historical connection with Brazil we share the same language we share the same um, the same background and what happens there's a Brazil is a huge pool of talent in football and to enter Europe for Brazilian players it's very hard to 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 become European players so Portugal is a platform and the Portuguese clubs understood that Portugal is a platform so what they started to do it's to invest huge on academies um, uh, and we started to, to buy young, very young. The talent uh, started to enter very young uh, from Brazil and national talent also. And um, so the, the most interesting thing is that we started modeling the, the profiles of players most sold to the, to the big, big clubs. Okay, So we started to understand what Real Madrid buys, what uh, Chelsea buys, what Manchester City buys what are the, the, the typical profile of the player. And we modeled the, our academies to that, to that profile. And that was the, the way we started to, to understand that players transfer are a stable revenue stream. And since then, what you see in the last decades, the, the, the club that uh, had a, a most, um, most higher um, revenue from, from players transfer was Bifica. And Bifica the, in 2004 was in a huge, huge, huge crisis, okay? In 2009, they started building the academy. 2012 um, started to, to, to be uh, number one uh, top formation in Portugal. And in 2016, they switch between um, foreign players to national players. So the players that um, that were, were built on the academy um, started to enter the first team. And then you have a huge sales like João Félix, uh, Ruben Dias. They all become young in the in the Bifica's academy. So um, in some, let me just, just take this. So sometimes problems are opportunities. And that's what the Portuguese club started to, to look for. They are good in football, but they don't generate uh, revenue as the, the big five. And if you want to compete, okay, compete for a, a place in a, in, a, in, a, in a group stage in, in, a, in Champions League, you cannot go further than that with a 100 million euros uh, revenue per year. Of course, you won't, you won't go further, but uh, the, the 100 million revenue can be 200 with players transfer. So... Um, that's the way Portuguese clubs just started to be more more competitive on a, on the European ecosystem. Okay, great, amazing insights. I, I, it's, it's nice that you put the, the story of Petrica. It, it it literally explains the whole model how the clubs have been able to use that uh, problem of uh, position of problem to uh, this time. Uh, just looking at the perspective of uh, what is being done in Wolverhampton Wanderers, it, uh, the Portuguese project. How do people in Portugal see this? And uh, is it okay. exciting so, for people in Portugal? So there's a huge connection between Jorge Mendes and the uh, Wolverhampton owners for Zoom. And what happens is that um, they modeled uh, Wolverhampton. That's my opinion, okay? They modeled Wolverhampton to be the next stage of the Portuguese clubs. So they understood that Portuguese clubs are... are... Uh, are, are are growing a lot of talent, a lot of younger talent. And in, in the way that they, they appreciate the Portuguese talent, they, mil, they build the, the club in the next phase of the, of the Portuguese talent. So they recruit the best players because George Mendes has a huge connection with Portuguese players, with Portuguese clubs. And the best young players in Portugal 
uh, go uh, two years early than the, their own explosion. Okay, you have Fabio Silva, you have Ruben Neves, uh, you have Rui Patricio. Before being uh, great players, they were already in Wolverhampton, and Wolverhampton um, positionates themselves in between the big six in the in the Premier League and, and the rest of them. That's where Wolverhampton wants to be, and they use the Portuguese young talent to fight for that position, to fight for the sixth um, place in the in the, in Premier League. Um, of course, uh, sometimes um, you see uh, other other problems in the governance of clubs and and private owners and and the the flow of the of the money, which which is something that UEFA has to to regulate more tight. Um, however, I see Wolverhampton as a as an interesting uh, project. Great. Uh, just a final question on this regard, Luis. Um, obviously, player the player the player transfers have been a constant revenue, which means like Portugal has done a lot in terms of the player development. And you being from a sports science background, uh, how do you see this? How how is Portugal able to be a very good in terms of play, player development process? Okay, so. Um, Player development uh, starts on a, a cultural problem. It's not um, a technical issue. I think it's more a cultural issue. So what Portuguese um, clubs are, are doing, they, they try to, to model uh, the market. They model the market where they buy players and they model the market where they sell players. And they understand they have to position themselves in between. And they have always to, to be looking at where to sell players, okay? So in between, they model their own uh, type of football. So if you go to, to, to Benfica Sporting, there's a particular style, and there are a lot of clubs doing this, but their particular style is looking forward to, to where to sell players. And they, they model the profile of each player in each position. Uh, what's the, the characteristics of the most sell um, left back. What's the characteristics of the most sell striker? Um, and they tried to model that in, in phases. So there, were, there was trying. Uh, then the second stage of the process, um, it's the identification and the recruitment, which Brazil plays a huge, uh, a huge benefit here. And of course, agents also play um, a huge role here, but uh, Brazil it's a, it's a nice background where Portuguese clubs start looking with players with 16 years old. Uh, Premier League is not going to look for Brazilian players with 16 years old. They just don't have the level to compete at the Premier League, um, Premier League level. So that's the opportunity for Portuguese clubs. Um, then on the third stage, they try to, 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 to understand that players are um, are, an, are assets from the company, so the the biggest asset of the clubs it's the stadium, then it's players. It's not the brand. It's players, and they all are understood as assets. Assets that has to 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 be um, to increase their value, and once they they arrive to the to the top of the of the product value. Uh, they are sold. They, they are not expecting them to, to play well anymore. Once they are on top, they are sold. Because once they are sold, you can uh, bring other player to occupy that position and start uh, generating value. Um, and to finalize the, the last stage, which is it's, um, um, it's being left uh, unclear and undone by uh, sportive directors sometimes, it's the last stage between 18 years old and um, the first team, 25% uh, of, uh, of um, champions players of under 19, they, they quit playing in five years, okay? Or less, which is huge uh, because um, until 19 years old, you, the, the, the age are tight, are fixed. Uh, the, 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 the teams are in, in two years interval. And from 19 onwards, it's free. So the problem is they always had, uh, they, all, they were stars um, in old 
uh, their, their teams until nine, 19 years old. And once they go to the first team, they are not stars anymore. So that's a huge problem. And there are, there are directors in clubs that they just go around those players for the last stage from the, the, the 19 years old until entering the first team. That's a critical uh, period where the clubs are looking with high attention because uh, if they are left uh, alone, uh, players just, just lost themselves. So um, that's the most critical point. It's from 19 years old until being a player on the first team. Great, great. Amazing insights. And I, I think the way you put it up uh, between the, the time they manage the youth to the senior level and to the first team, this is a great takeaway for even Asian teams. Yes, they are operating in a different level, but this, this could be a great takeaway. Thanks, Luir. I think uh, it is a it is a very big overdose of player development. I'm just pulling back it to uh, something on the likes of uh, finances. Uh, uh, Stephen, uh, with the recent flourish of sports techs and clubs creating their own innovation hubs, we see Barcelona, we see Man City having their own innovation hubs. How can these things actually help investors and investments come into football uh, yeah thank, thank you uh, i think some of the points that um that fabian and that lewis have just talked about actually could probably link into this uh, in a sense if you think what a, i guess what an investment hub or an innovation hub rather is trying to do is trying to get investment in and what do investors look for conventionally if you're a financial investor you're looking for some kind of return on your investment. You put it in very blunt terms. Um, and I think what, what these hubs are trying to do is find a way of get some investment coming in, but offering something in return clearly to the clubs too. And I think that the, probably the interesting thing here is that the return on investment and the value that's provided, yes, it might be pure financial investment. It might be pure financial value, but it might also be kind of social return on investment or social value. Uh, and that again brings back to the nature of clubs in different countries and different contexts. We've got a financial aspect, but we've also got that kind of broader social investment too. But if you look at the, the ones you've mentioned, whether it's at Barcelona or whether it's UEFA, um, what they're trying to do is bring together different stakeholders. So whether it's commercial partners, financial partners, academic expertise, harness that knowledge in order to develop or derive um, innovations which will be productive for the sport industry. And, you know, I think, um, I think it, was, uh, it was, Lewis talked about assets. If you think about it in asset terms, um, what are the assets of a football club? Well, pretty simply, they are the stadium, they are the players, and of course, they are also the supporters. Those, those are the asset categories that we have. And some of the innovations that are going on, I think, are trying to probably, it puts it a bit bluntly maybe, but leverage value from those things. Um, not at the expense of the nature of supporters or the nature of the community relationships, but also recognise, as Fabian mentioned, that things like what a supporter wants maybe now is different from what a supporter wanted 20 years ago. So if it's to do with improved data or improved understanding of what's taking place on the pitch, that's something that um, these innovation hubs are working on and have been working on about how you provide a different kind of experience. Uh, the stadium is a, is a fantastic example. Look at the quality of different stadiums in different countries. Um, so I'll go back to England in this case. Look at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. You know, an extraordinary fit to think that's a football stadium because it's so much more than what I might have remembered as a football stadium. But it's got so many ways in which there are things which provide value and, an, and enrich the, the uh, supporter experience but also provide financial returns to the football club in order that the football club can do the things it wants to do. So the stadium is a really exciting opportunity to do much more with. You know, I was thinking completely off the topic, but look at look at the look at the the nonsense around the the new ABBA album and the ABBA concerts and the fact that those concerts are going to take place are going to involve involve holograms rather than the. You know, I don't. I'm not suggesting that's the way we want football to go, but you can see how technology can create slightly different things that might actually open up uh, revenue potential. So the stadiums are one thing, the supporter, deepening that supporter experience, uh, helping clubs to grow their revenue at the same time, that's obviously fundamental as long as we are true to the nature of that relationship and don't just 
turn it into an economic relationship. And I think that's the kind of clever bit around uh, a lot of football finance to recognise the social value as well as the, the economic potential. And I think as uh, I think it was Lewis was talking about some of the player trading issues, some of the work that's gone on around uh, coaching and player trading models. You know, that's innovation that's already been lucratively utilised by clubs in different countries to, to try to do that. So those are things in sense that are going on. But what you can see how um, if football looks imaginatively and the innovation hubs bring the right expertise together, we're looking for lots of ways in which football can can diversify its income and can strengthen its business uh, situation while also retaining its social and, and community significance. And, you know, and, and that, for me, is the exciting bit of it again. Great. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to the sport, uh, it's business. And unfortunately, people working in the business side of sports obviously have to deal with the, the, the wrong word, which is the money word. But, but nothing can be done uh, unless and until you bring money into the sport. Um, it's not going to be effective. So I think you you put it very, very in a humble fashion that just look at it the way that what are the assets which is available with the club and how you actually do the innovations over on top of it with sports technology and try to monetize over it. Uh, thanks for brilliantly putting it, uh, Stephen. And, and the last thing I want to touch upon with this panel is uh, there's so much of uh, improvements and so much of attraction or like um, attention over women's football. So I'll start with Daniel. Um, Daniel, uh, in terms of women's football, obviously in the recent times, the participation is also higher and also the engagement in the recent uh, global tournaments, uh, the, uh, the engagement is really high as well. So what can we see uh, actually foresee business opportunities in women's football? Okay, first off, just to, just to follow on, I'm, I think what we, we've all been talking about is different opportunities for like different types of growth strategies for the business. I think we picked off a few and there's, there's so many more where we could take this discussion. For me, be, if we talked about this in the business sense, I'd see women's football as a real growth opportunity, but at the same time, it's also the right thing to do and I think that we should have been doing arguably from the very start. Um, and to caveat me, this, this my insight on this, which I feel like I'm I'm, I'm okay place to comment, but obviously it would have been better to have uh, a female scholar who's doing some of the research in this area. So I'm going to dedicate some of the discussion to a, a, a colleague called, uh, well, Alex, Dr. Alex Colvin at Salford University, um, um, but Alexandra Colvin, so who's doing some of the research in this work. I'm going to talk about a couple of quick, uh, about four areas really quick, the structure and management, player welfare, women in leadership positions and then participation. So the first aspect is if we looked at structure and management across FIFA organisations, those have been the top tier, uh, top ranked FIFA organisations all have a, a, a women's league. If we go into the, the bottom tier, only 65% have a women's league. So we can see there's different priorities globally that we need to need to be interested in. When we look at how these are, are funded, which is an important part of it, you can either be through national associations, um, through the government, through sponsors or through other sources. I've just got the UEFA stats in across the UEFA country, 79% are funded by associations, 14% by sponsors, um, very little is by, by government, and then we've got 7% 7, 7 coming from other sources. Now, this is important because when we talk about sponsors, and I'll break down into one league, it impacts player welfare. So uh, Alex Colvin wrote it. A groundbreaking paper in the journal Managing Sport and Leisure recently that is free to access about working conditions because we've seen in the Women's Super League and with the FA Women's Super League um, a tremendous amount of um, funding. So in 18 19, um, there was a requirement to go full time. So that makes a women's career, a woman's career playing football, a real opportunity and a real genuine pathway not just something that they are trying to make happen around other work and commitments. At the same time, there's still a lot, Alex Paper identifies there's some serious issues with the precariousness, precarity of these contracts, the working conditions and things that we need to move forward. So we've seen progress and we've seen big investments like over 10 million from Barclays and I think it was the 1819 season uh, or 1920 season. Um, around the national women's team, but also the FA Women's Super League. So that's serious money, but there's still a lot of progress to make happen. So there's a couple of issues. And I think that's important because uh, I think what's important to consider is who are the women in leadership positions? So we've talked about sporting directors getting on boards and deciding, making decisions and and assuming, trying to get resources. If we look at where are women in, in leadership positions, we've seen 
a very slow change. We've seen progress at, at FIFA with uh, Fatma. We've seen key women at FIFA like um, Ornella, who are, who are making changes. We also, if, we look, if I look closer to home, we've got Professor Laura McAllister, who sits in the for the Football Association of Wales, but also on your UEFA committee. So, and we've got Rupinda Baines, who also sits on the FA board. So we've got really important positions assumed by, by women, but we need more because when it, if we want to change and want to make things more equal, we need pe people on there that will fight the corner. Like we'd have a sporting director fighting the corner for sport and performance, not just against the commercial director and, and what else. We also need people representing their groups and their aspects of the game. And, and then finally, and this weaves together, um, I, I guess around participation, I, I think we need to look at that from a public policy government perspective. And I would champion Germany, I'd champion Denmark as places across the respective regions of Germany, across the municipalities of, of Denmark. There is investment in volu volunteer programmes, in community sport pitches, in facilities. When I reflect on what we have in the UK, we've got the economic downturn, we've had austerity policies, we've had poor investments in public uh, in public pitches. What that means is we have poor experiences for volunteers, we have poor experiences for players, boys and girls and people walk away. When we have a bad experiences, we don't often go back. So there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of lessons that we can learn, but it's not, uh, the evidence is there. We know what works, but we just need governments and, and governments and policies to follow through to see through those those changes. Agreed. I think uh, I asked the part, I asked the question in terms of participation of players, but I think you recently re uh, you very well put it in the way that uh, the participation also has to be from the perspective of management and executive side of football. So it was really amazing. And anybody want to touch upon this aspect, Fabian or like Luis, what's happening with respect to women's football and what do you see where it's going on? Liz, you want, you want to take the question? Yeah. Uh, some more issues. Probably, yeah, fine. It's fine. So I just want to like check if there are any questions from the audience. Okay, um, there's some question from Lokesh. Okay, I think the question is to Villa, uh, Luis Villa. Uh, so he says, what percentage of income from player sales goes into club development? and increasing revenue and can you differentiate between smaller and bigger club perspective uh, I, I i don't think you are uh, working from the club side but maybe some insights uh, onto the idea of investment would be great i can go exactly on on the great. on the on the question so um so what what comes along let me just go back and and understand the following um for instance um Stephen, in the in the beginning of the, of today's um, discussion, mentioned that um, we have to, and, and I wrote it here, uh, and we have to 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 be less dependent on some revenue streams. Um, and we were talking about TV TV rights, the revenue streams of TV, uh, which are huge dependent. So what we have in Portugal, it's that the bigger clubs. Uh, have like revenue streams in in the proportion of 40%, which is a bit like um, if you go on, on the 20 most um, valuable clubs in Europe, you see that TV, uh, it's around 46% of the, of the revenue of clubs. And in Portugal, we have, so the first three clubs, they, they, they have like 40% of dependence on the revenue of TV rights. But if you go to lower clubs, and that's the huge problem, their dependence on TV rights go above 90%, which is huge. Um, if they go to lower divisions, it's the end of the clubs because uh, the revenue streams of TV, the revenue in TV rights on, on the second division, it's much lower than on the first division. The, the expenses are a bit the same because the contract of the players still running. Uh, so they have a huge dependence on the TV rights. So um, what, what uh, the, the main three clubs in Portugal start doing with the transfer of players, it's decreasing the, the level of dependence on the TV rights. So nowadays you have like 40% in good years, 40% um, of the revenue can be from transfer players. For instance, Benfica um, 
usually sells around 100 million uh, euros in players. They invest around in 20 million, uh, 30 million, except the, the, the last year of the pandemic, which, you, which is totally different. And the revenue streams go around 200 million. So uh, they do it more than one third of the, of the revenue. They go on transfer players, which is huge, which is, which is huge. And, and especially in Portugal, you can enclose the gap to bigger clubs. Um, like, uh, uh, I'm not saying like Real Madrid and Barcelona, because you, you'll never be those, but uh, like uh, uh, at least Arsenal sometimes, or uh, so this type of clubs, um, Villa Real, Real Ciudad, no, you can, you can be much, much closer to them. Uh, yeah, I think you put it really well. I think one of uh, what they actually want, uh, less than that, because uh, for the pandemic, uh, they are investing in the youth. And it's such a pity that you put Arsenal along those lines. <laughs> Me growing up as a as a Premier League fan, Arsenal are much more, and it's, it's such a pity they have like, fallen a bit now. They, they were the club that spent most this this last uh, last window, the summer yeah. window of player transfers, and, and they, they are have... still and they are still <laughs> playing poor. So I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. From a neutral football perspective, I hope they do really well. Uh, anyways, I think it was a great panel. Uh, we started looking at traditional. Uh, revenue streams and then uh, like, uh, Stephen touched upon the various investment strategies and how clubs are doing and the proper properties are doing and we went into uh, trying to understand how the organization and structure wise is the differences and we tried to learn something for Asia and uh, Africa and then we again touched upon the player development aspect so it was a brilliant panel. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Louis and Stephen. I hope to meet you again. Uh, or next time the conclave is going to be even bigger. And hopefully I can see you in, in, in person as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.